Hi, I'm Nathan Cole of natesviolin.com, and today we will be talking about how to find your ideal setup, left hand setup especially for the violin. First of all, if you are not subscribed to my channel here, or if you're not sure if you are, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That'll make sure you don't miss any updates from me. I got a lot of good stuff for you. Um, so a lot of times people will ask, you know, what's the best place for my elbow or how high should my thumb be or how far should the left hand be from the violin neck? All these kinds of questions are sort of like asking, you know, what's the best waist size for my pants or what's the best color tie to wear? You know, clearly the best waist size is the one that <laughs> fits you. It doesn't let your pants fall off and it doesn't cut off your circulation either. Um, Similarly, with ties, the best color is the one that coordinates with the outfit that you're wearing. So, even though violin is basically one size fits all, little variation in the sizes of instruments, basically though one size, we are not all one size. Clearly, we're not all one set of proportions. So, many things about violin setup depend on your body, your proportions specifically the length of your arms, the length of your fingers, and of course any physical limitations that you might have. But, you know, if this were really totally different for every single person on earth, there wouldn't be much point in making a video about it. And the truth is there are, well, the truth is that there are some universal truths and these can help guide your decisions. That's why I'm here. Really every setup decision that you make on the violin you need to ask yourself two things. First, does it hurt? <laughs> or does it cause tension that's going to hurt later on? Assuming neither of those things is true. How does the decision I'm about to make, how does that deliver my four fingers to the four strings? And that is really the aim of all the other parts of the body on the violin. How to get your fingers onto the strings with that perfect blend of freedom and structure. What do I mean by freedom? Well, we want each finger to be able to move independently through three different kinds of motions, three different key motions. So let me actually um, switch the view here. First kind of motion is the lifting or dropping motion up, down. It would be this. Okay, and then we've got the horizontal motion of going from one string to another, right? Or it's the same kind of motion if you're doing left hand pizzicato, yeah? And finally, what we might call the vertical motion up and down the string. So that's either you're sliding up and down the string with a finger or you're lifting and replacing, but in any case, you're moving the finger and not the hand. Those are the three key motions. Structure. You also want your hand to have structure or a frame, a hand frame. That means that the fingers, all four fingers work the same as one another. You know, they basically keep the same shape. Um, you don't have the first finger working like this and the fourth finger over here working, you know, flopping straight up in the air or something like that. The structure or frame also means that your hand doesn't have to adjust just to accommodate any particular finger. Most commonly, you see that with the fourth finger, where one, two, and three may work fine, but then every time you have to play a four, you've got to do something weird with your hand, or maybe you have to come around like that just to use the fourth finger, but really, it's any of the four fingers at all. You don't want your setup to have to adjust just for one finger or two. <laughs> now, what would it mean perhaps to have freedom without structure? Well, what that could mean is that the hand, the fingers are wonderfully free. They can reach anywhere you want, but the fingers all might work differently. And, you know, I'm moving around all the time. So what it, ends up happening is that I sort of search for every note. Every note feels different, every position feels different, and my hand might have to adjust for different fingers. If I want a low finger there, I gotta move this around and take the thumb up here, move the elbow. <laughs> um, 
therefore practice is going to be kind of note to note. You get something one time, not the next time. Performing, same thing. You, you do a lot well, but it's kind of hit and miss. The choices of fingering that you make might be kind of haphazard. Uh, you're never really sure what's going to work best for your hand. Could also have structure without freedom. And in that case, you know, things may look really nice when your hand isn't moving. <laughs> may look like a nice setup, but in truth, your hand might be set and rigid. And so when you go to a note, adjust notes up and down, let's go back to this view again. You go back to, you, you want to play a higher four. It's very slow to move. The one might be kind of jammed up against the neck and it can't get away. Um, similarly, I might have to just to get a finger over to another string rather than reaching it over as I could if I had freedom, I'm going to have to help with my arm, adjust other things, or I might even have to move the violin one way or another just to get around that stiff hand. As far as fingering choices, I'm going to be a little stuck there as well. Maybe kind of vanilla fingerings, you know, very predictable. I can only do certain patterns. I do those well, they're in tune, but it's very predictable. Vibrato, too, is not going to work so great. So, what are we after? What does it look like to have freedom with structure? Some things don't <laughs> depend on your body size, your proportions. One of those is finger angle. Let's get one more view here. The angle of the fingers what I'm referring to there is whether they are very steep and upright, like that. You see it's almost a 90 degree angle here at this knuckle that's touching the string. That's too steep. <laughs> okay. On the, to the other extreme would be really flat fingers. Here they're almost <laughs> lying flat on the string. Obviously don't want that either. Now there's a big range in between there and you know, I'd like to explore that as I play, but in general, a nice finger angle is neither too steep nor too flat. It's kind of right in the middle. For my taste, it's closer to upright than it is to flat, but it's something along these lines. With every finger having just about the same finger angle. Got freedom that way. Each finger can move independently of the others through all the three motions, right? I've got structure, all the four fingers look and behave the same, and I don't have to adjust for any finger. Now, it is a rare hand that doesn't have some kind of compromise. You know, there, there may have been someone in the history of violin playing uh, whose hand just totally fit the violin. Maybe that was Heifetz, I don't know. I think even Heifetz had to make the good kind of compromises that we're going to talk about. So let's look at the extremes of the hand, meaning um, first and fourth fingers. Now, rarely can you have one and four just feeling amazing and natural, you know, just as it would hang out in space. For most hands, either you're going to have the first finger reached back somewhat, or the fourth finger reached up, or some combination of both. Now the fact is that it is healthier for your one to reach back a little bit than it is for the four to stretch up. So anytime you've got to choose between those, you want that one reaching back. Your one can just do that all day long, at least if you don't take it to an extreme, whereas you're going to run into problems if you're always asking your four to reach up. So that is the most common compromise allows for the most consistent angles of the fingers. So you see the way I generally have things set up, all the four fingers about the same angle. So I'm talking about that last knuckle where it contacts the string, but I'm also talking about the general curve of each finger, including the fourth finger. Now if your four never wants to curve, if it's always doing something weird, I've got another video about that called a pinky power, some exercises you can look at to get that four behaving a little bit more. Here would be 
if I just let my one do whatever it wanted, very comfortable here, then my four would really have to reach up, right? Or every time I use the four, I would have to move something else. That's what I don't want. And of course, I don't want the other extreme either. I don't want my four so comfortable that my one has to reach far back from the others. And especially, I don't want the first finger jammed up against the neck. Um, let's take a look at that. Here, my first finger, you know, you can see the skin is just really <laughs> compressed up against that neck. I can barely get it away. Um, and that's going to promote squeezing, or it could be the result of squeezing between that thumb and first finger. Very bad habit, leads to all kinds of bad things, especially the first finger not being free. Ah, Got to stop that. So just to recap on what it is that you're looking for, you want a good compromise that results in one and four that are both free and structured. Okay. And if one and four are feeling all right, chances are two and three sitting in between are going to be just fine too. So if you're uh, <laughs> trying this out at home and your hand just isn't sitting right, got to start investigating to, to figure out why. So the first question actually does not depend on your body or its proportions, because um, this is going to be true for everyone. We're going to look at the space that you can create at these base knuckles. So the base knuckles are the ones closest to your wrist here, these big base knuckles. So if they're all squished together, let's get a view to see what that might look like. So here my one and two, they're squished together there, yeah? And that means that very limited mobility there, um, much worse if my two and three also squish together, and then if my four squished as well, then I really, my hand is locked. So what I want to look at here is opening up that space. See, I can put one and two right next to each other, a half step, but still open up space there. Same with three. I can add the third finger to the mix and have space between one, two, and three. One, two, three, and four. I can have them squished, or I can have the space open, even though there's just a half step between all of those notes. I want it nice and open. So that is likely the first thing to check on. If you can play while creating that space there, your hand is going to be much more free, your fingers more independent. So that may result, by the way, in the fingers hitting the string with different parts of the fingertip, and that is perfectly okay. You know, I um, learned initially that the all four fingers had to hit the strings in exactly the same part. It had to be on the left side of the fingertip. My four is just never going to do that. Um, I can show you what I mean here. If I tried to force my four to play on the inside part of the string, uh, inside part of the fingertip, see how straight and reached out it would be? It's kind of locked that way. If I allow it to go over, it doesn't always look textbook, but that just happens to be the way my fingers are curved. It's likely to get more like that as I get older too. So my four hits on the right side of the fingertip for me, and that is just fine. It can go wherever it needs to go. The next thing you want to look at is the height of your base knuckles against the neck. So what I'm talking about there, how high is your hand, yeah? And I usually measure it, again, those base knuckles next to the neck. How high are those? So with my setup, my first finger, and actually all four fingers tend to hit. I'm hitting the neck just above the base knuckle. Now, that's going to change if you have longer fingers or shorter fingers. If you've got longer fingers, then generally your hand is going to be, it's going to sit lower because you've got the long fingers to still give you that nice finger angle. Shorter fingers, 
your hand is going to sit higher, right? You'll need that to get the right finger angle. If I try to do that with a super high hand, now look, my finger angle is way too steep. So that is going to depend on the length of your fingers. Again, it's all about that finger angle, how it contacts the string. So when you're experimenting with that, you know, let the thumb find its comfortable place, find its comfortable height. We're going to have a chance to change that a little bit later, but just try to get it close. Um, find a height that seems to give you the right finger angle before you start moving around the left arm, the left elbow. Once you do get comfortable, then we can examine the left elbow because that also is going to change the height of the knuckles, but it's not going to change how high your thumb is, right? If I move my elbow to the right, look how high those bass knuckles get compared to the neck of the violin. Move it to the left, those knuckles get lower and lower. But my thumb, how high my thumb is above the fingerboard, not really changing. So that's why I wanted you to find a decent, decently comfortable thumb position before experimenting with that left arm. So if you've found a place you kind of like your thumb, but everything is too steep, probably you've got to move that elbow a little bit to the left, relax it to a more neutral position. If everything is way too flat, then maybe it's time to move the elbow to the right to get that finger angle just right again. A common thing I see is that people, when they were young and perhaps learning advanced repertoire, they had shorter arms, shorter fingers. In order to reach those notes up there, in order to get the finger angle right, they had to bring that elbow over to the right far around. And then as they got older and bigger, they never changed that habit. So now with full length arms and fingers, they're still way over like that and their fingers are way too steep on the fingerboard. So that is something to look at. Okay, we've looked at the height of the base knuckles and messed around with the thumb and the left arm to fine tune those. Now it's time to look the distance between the hand and the neck, right? Talking about this distance here. You want to look especially at your one and your four, the extremes of the hand. First of all, to see if your first finger is jammed, really squeezed up against the neck. You also want to see, is your fourth finger too far away from the neck? If you're always having to see how I'm pronating my left forearm there, if you're always having to do something like that just to use the fourth finger, or if you're having to stretch it and make it straight just to reach, it's probably too far away from the neck. Again, you're going to look for the best compromise. Is it your entire hand that needs to get closer? Then you can change where your thumb sits on the neck, can't you? Move the entire hand closer or further. What's a little more common is that it will just be the fourth finger side that, ne ne that, <laughs> that needs to get closer. Um, so in that case, here's what we're dealing with. My four now is too far away. It's having to stretch out to get used. So now I'm going to have to pronate my forearm just to get this side of the hand closer to the neck. Okay. Again, looking for that best compromise. Sometimes doing that will also free up the one from the side of the neck. So that's a useful move. Here my one is jammed, my four is too far away. By pronating that forearm, bringing this closer to the neck of the instrument, I've got my four usable again and my one is freer too. Next thing to look at, the position of the violin, in other words, which o'clock. So if that doesn't make any sense, this would be 12 o'clock, right? I'm looking at you, violin is also, scroll is pointed at you. Um, I'm not going to play that way. <laughs> that feels terrible. Um, but I'm also not going to play at 9 o'clock, where it's straight out to the side. Uh, I don't think anybody really plays quite like that either. So in that range is what we're looking at. If you've got longer arms, you're generally going to have it more to the left. So not 12, not 11, but closer to 10, closer perhaps even to 9. And that's so that your bow arm can sit comfortably. 
if you've got that really long arm, you don't want the instrument over here or that arm's going to be stuck here, right? So shorter arms. You need to have it more out and more in front of you so that that bow arm is comfortable. That will also slightly change things here, so just wanted to mention that. What have I not mentioned with mostly good reason? Um, the chin rest. People have different chin rests, of course, different positions for the chin rest. Uh, mine is to the left side of the tailpiece. You'll see some that are even further to the left. You'll see some that go all the way over the tailpiece. You'll see some that are centered on the tailpiece. For most people, no matter body type, it's not going to move. It doesn't need to move too much from where it is here. I'm not talking about height. I'm just talking about left, right. Um, some people are tempted to really center it. And aesthetically, that can seem like a good idea because, uh, you know, then you're looking, your eyes looking straight down the fingerboard. Uh, the problem is if you get your violin too much to this side, got my chin more and more to the right, that G string ends up being a long way over there. And is your arm really going to be willing always to get over as much as it needs, as opposed to here, where it can be a little bit more comfortable. So that's something you can play with, but most people don't know, need to play too much with that. Also, I haven't mentioned the shoulder rest issue. <laughs> that's uh, an issue probably beyond the scope of this video. All I want to say is that for some people, their shoulder rest setup, you see that I don't use one. Sometimes the shoulder rest setup will put the violin at too much of an angle like this. All right. When I play with no shoulder rest, it's fairly close to being parallel to the floor. Of course, it's not exactly parallel, but it's fairly close. For some people, the shoulder rest tilts it a lot like this. If that's the case, now you can look at my finger angle. Very steep. Let me switch view to that. I'm, I'm holding my violin now at this angle. Boy, those fingers are really steep on the instrument. I would have to compensate by moving my elbow to the left, and that just it puts a lot of stuff out of whack. So that is something you can look at. Um, won't be true for everybody, but for some, having a flatter violin is going to help find the natural position for your hand. OK, so a quick recap. You want to know what it is you're after with all the setup stuff. And that is a hand with freedom and structure. Freedom means that each of the four fingers can move independently through the three key motions. That's lifting and dropping, horizontal, which means moving between the four strings, and vertical, which means either sliding along the string or lifting and replacing high and low fingers. That's freedom. Structure. All four fingers work the same way. All you have to do is compare your two and your three, which probably behave very well, with your four, which may want to point <laughs> all around up at the ceiling or the wall or something when it lifts up and down. All four fingers should work the same. In a structured hand, you don't have to adjust just to accommodate one finger or another. Yeah? Paying particular attention to your first finger that it's not jammed against the side. And the fourth finger, no big reaches. Nicely curved if you can. If that's not happening for you, you want to look first at the space at your base knuckles. Are they squished together or nicely spaced there? The height of the base knuckles and the thumb. How is that working for your hand according to your finger lengths? And then the position of your left elbow to fine tune that finger angle. The distance between your hand and the neck, whether that is your entire hand or just one side of it, which means pronating the forearm here. Finally, the position of the violin where is your chin rest? Or <laughs> where is your chin? Is it even on the chin rest? And then the angle of the violin, if necessary, that has to do with your shoulder rest generally. So 
hopefully now that you know what you're after, what's really important, you can base all those setup questions, all those setup decisions on that, how to deliver those four fingers there with freedom and structure. So I really thank you for watching. You can see much more on my channel and on my site, natesviolin.com. Please subscribe if you haven't yet so as not to miss any updates, new stuff, and uh, let me know what's working for you or what's not in the comments below, okay? See you next time. Thanks.